everyone. I had a card from Miss Nancy Nick, who just lost the uh, love of her life. Her husband had passed away. Uh, and I just wanted to read this card to you. Um, Miss Nancy is such a, a wonderful lady. And uh, she just loves her church. She loves each and every one of you guys. The card says, Grace is such a simple word, yet it means so much. I'd like to take a moment by sincerely thanking my church family for all the calls, cards, and prayers during the illness and passing of my husband, Bill. I thank you for your uh, visits, words of encouragement, and the lovely plant basket. I am so fortunate to have a loving and caring church family. My encouragement to all of you, enjoy your mate. Tell them you love him or her daily, for you never know when the day will come that God calls you home. And there was a scripture here that says, Therefore, since we have justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. And that comes from Romans 5. Whether it comes as encouragement from a friend, the warm smile of a loved one, or the special strength God grants for each new day, May today bring new meaning to God's wonderful work of grace in our lives. With heartfelt thanks and love, Miss Nancy Nick. Thank you, Miss Nancy. Never know how long you're going to be here. That's why it's so important for you to be here today. So let's stand and worship the Lord. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful where the streams of abundance flow blessed be your name blessed be your name sun shining down on you every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise when the darkest closes in Lord still I will say blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of your Lord blessed be your glorious name Blessed be your name With the sun shining down on me With the world all that it should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering To the pain in the offering Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name You give and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name Go! 
I can't hear you from back here. Hello. One more time. What? My heart will choose to say, Lord, bless it. Your 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, He's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring he's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. He's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up Good morning. Several years ago, author and minister Robert Fulgham wrote a very popular book entitled, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. He stated in his introduction, wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, but there in the sand pile at Sunday school. Among the things that he shared that he learned in kindergarten were these. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take anything that isn't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. Warm cookies and milk are good for you. When you go out into the world, watch out for traffic, hold hands, and stick together. And my personal favorite, take a nap every afternoon. Young children have an unquenchable thirst for knowledge and an enthusiasm that cannot be duplicated. They run to get on the bus in the morning, and they run back to the house after they get off the bus even though they're carrying those 50-pound backpacks with them. They raise their hands collectively when the teacher asks a question. When it's time to go to lunch, they all want to be the first in line, and every student wants to sit in the front row. But as time goes on and they move along in, the, in school, where does that enthusiasm go? They become less excited about answering a question Lugging that oversized book bag becomes more mature, and they move further and further from the front row until they are all fighting for seats in the back, or at least looking for a tall kid they can hide behind so the teacher won't call on them. So it got me to thinking, what's wrong with the front row? Dr. Paul Adams, a dean at Wilkes University, said in a recent article, it's clear that students tend to do much better in class when they sit close to the front because they become more engaged in the class. When you sit in the back of the class, you have a tendency to get distracted and watch other kids instead of the teacher. And I'm looking this morning at our front row. <laughs> there are some stalwarts who every week sit in the front row. Congratulations to you all. And I got to wonder, well, what's wrong with the front row? So I went and sat in the seats, and they're just as cushy and comfortable as the other seats. The only thing I can figure is that the reason people don't sit in the front row is that they won't have that little wire loop in the, underneath their chair to put their communion cup after they're finished. But I think it really is a, a matter of people having that safe barrier. Uh, you know, George, if I were to ask you a question, 
you have that chair in front of you to block any kind of attempt at the answer. I, I know you would probably duck underneath that chair if I, if I did. So how can we apply this worshiping and where we should sit? Obviously, it would be impossible for everyone to sit in the front row. The location of your seat is, in fact, irrelevant. Whether you sit in the front, the middle, or back of the church, if your mind and your spirit are in the front row with the Lord, it's okay. It's all about giving God your best, regardless of where you're sitting. Good stewards recognize the blessing of God in their lives. In gratitude, the stewards designed to give back to God and to others as much as possible. They offer a sacrifice of praise to God through the gift of their time, talent, and treasure in service of God and neighbor. In Luke 6.38 it says, Give and gifts will be given to you. A good measure, packed together, shaken down, and overflowing will be poured into your lap. For the measure you measure with you will be measured back to you. We must learn and remember to give the best we have to God. It's not just because God promises great blessings when we do, but because the meaning of our lives is found in becoming like Jesus. Jesus gave his best time, talent, and treasure to his Father and to all those he served. He gave away everything he had, even his own body and blood, in sacrifice for our sins. God wants our best. He wants our best in everything, and he wants us to be, he wants to be our first love. It is a holy and special moment every time we meet with him. Let us give thanks and continue to put him first. And let's all remember, in our hearts, we're all in the front row. <clears throat> After our communion song, the men will come forward and distribute the cup and the loaf. Let us hold the gifts and take in unison upon the reading of God's word. Is great and you are good so good and you always keep your promises your ways are loving us are so high so high your ways are loving us so high so high your ways are loving us so deep and wide and never will they change How I love your ways Because, because you are enough for us We cast our cares and trust in your heart for us your name is great and you are good so good and you always keep your promises and you won't betray your faithfulness your ways are loving us so high so high your ways So high, so high, your ways are loving us. Deep and wide and never will they change. How I love your ways. How I love your ways. You are wrong. 
You're the grace in every morning sun. This I know, I am known, I am held and I am loved. You're the refuge for the restless heart, and you sing a new song over us. This I know, I am known, I am held and I am loved. I am loved by the King, loved by the King, I am loved. Oh, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. us are so high so high your ways are loving us they're so high so high your ways are loving us they're deep and wide and never will they change so deep and wide and never will they change so deep and wide and never will they change how I love your ways how I love your ways Dear God, please help us clear our minds of this world and its distractions. Please help us to tune in to this table and to exactly what it means and what it stands for. Help us to get engaged up close and personal to the cross. Please help us to um, use this juice to visualize what Jesus did on the cross when his blood was shed on our behalf and his flesh was pierced. I just pray that we do this right now and we examine ourselves and we ask for forgiveness and we do this in a worthy manner. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
received from the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper had ended, he took the cup and giving thanks, said, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, haven't you have blessed us in so many ways? And Lord, Lord, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills are yours, but Lord, you have given us the opportunity to, to share in these blessings and to, and to be stewards of, of your many great blessings. Lord, now we come to worship you by returning a portion of these blessings back to you. Lord, we pray that you will help us to be good stewards of the gifts that are, that are given, that we might share your word with, with, with those who, who need to hear it. Lord, again, we thank you for all that you are. In Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. I found out yesterday afternoon that I was going to pinch hit for Ron today. He was, uh, the Lawrence's are in the process of moving a couple of doors down, and somehow he hurt his foot and wasn't able to walk. And he asked if I would uh, pinch hit for him. He said, uh, get something out of your hip pocket and uh, use it and I don't carry my sermons in my hip pocket but I do have a file and uh, I'm not the kind of a guy who can come up with a sermon in a couple of hours or so it takes me days I know it doesn't always show it but it takes me <laughs> takes me days and so I begin to wonder what I would say today and me being a Psalms oriented guy like I am I immediately went to the Psalms I got home and Mary said I knew that's what you were going to do 
since there are 150 of them, I had to make a decision about which one. So I started with number one. And as I began to read, I realized that I didn't need to look any farther. Here's why. We are living in the most divided times that I can ever remember. We are politically divided. We're divided between parties. We are divided within political parties. Uh, and it's not just division and thought, it's hostility and uh, uncivility and on and on it goes. It's, I just dread this election time. There is so much political division in our country. We are religiously divided. I saw just this week where more people say they are non-religious in our country today than ever before. They are called nuns, not N-U-N-S, but N-O-N-E-S, not religiously affiliated at all, the largest percentage ever. Our churches are divided over moral issues. Uh, I understand that among our churches, uh, we may uh, have division over the role of women in the church, women ministers and women elders and those kinds of things. Division in the religious community. We are culturally divided over LGBT issues, same-sex marriage, the value of life, whether it's in the womb or whether you are getting old like me and maybe we'll be on the next hit list. You don't, you're not worth keeping around as some are already beginning to think. So division, division, division. Everywhere we look, there is division. How are we to respond to all of this confusion? What are we to do? Well, I think Psalm 1 can help us and give us some clear direction today. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This psalm points out a consistent theme that runs throughout the Bible. And that theme is this, there are only two ways to live our lives. They're described in the very first book of the Old Testament. At the very beginning of Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the perfect environment of the garden. They could either choose to walk with God or go their own way. That theme continues in the very first book in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus describes those two ways as the broad road that leads to destruction and the narrow road that leads to life. These two ways have been described as the God-centered life and the self-centered life. 
Psalm 1 describes it as the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Each one of us today is following one of those two ways. Let's think about them. Think about the way of the righteous. The first thing to notice is that it's the happy way. It says, blessed is the one. The Hebrew word is much more descriptive than the English word. Uh, it would go something like this. Oh, the happiness many times over is the person who travels this way. You're just so happy you can't hardly stand it as you travel this way is the concept. But our culture tells us that happiness is found in doing things our own way and having lots of those things. But reality tells us that that's just not true. Some of the unhappiest people that you will ever meet are those who have tried all of those things and who have all of those things and they didn't find happiness at all. Because you see, true happiness is only found in following Jesus. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said this, I came that we could have life to the full. The abundant life is what the scripture is talking about. The reason Jesus came was that we could have life to the full, that we could have the abundant life. And that's not just talking about in eternity. That's talking about in the here and now. If you want life at its best, the thing to do is to follow Jesus. That's the reason our theme is we want everyone to follow Jesus. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by him only true happiness can be found when we follow jesus the psalmist, psalmist goes on to point out that there are certain things that we do not do when we are following the way of the righteous or when we are following jesus there, there are certain things we do not do he says we don't walk in step with the wicked we don't stand in the way that sinners take and we don't sit in the company of mockers now those three words walk stand and sit describe the slippery slope down towards compromise with the world that can happen to us. Think about that. Walk. We don't walk along trying to get in step and keep in step with the wicked. In other words, we don't march to the cadence of the world. We don't listen to the advice of the world. Stand means we don't stand around looking to see what the world has to offer. Maybe sort of even liking what we see. That's the way the devil works. He always packages the consequences of sin in nice packages that look good and entice. But we don't Stop to take a look at that. And then he says we don't sit. We don't sit down. We don't become like them or a part of them. We don't participate with them in the things of the world. We must avoid that slippery slope by not listening to the world's counsel, adopting its practices, or becoming comfortable in its ways. First John 2, chapter 2, beginning in verse 15, 
the message says, don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. So, these are things that we don't do if we're going to walk in the way of the righteous. But it's not always a things that we don't do that are important. It's things that we are to do that are important as well. And so the psalmist, instead of dwelling on the things that we don't do, he says, here are some things that we do. We delight in the law of the Lord and we meditate on it day and night. In other words, we delight in reading and obeying God's word. We delight in it. Delight means to have a high degree of pleasure in something, to really enjoy it. And I want to ask this morning, does that describe how you feel about reading God's word? It really ought to, but does it? Let me give you a tip. We won't delight in reading it if we don't delight in obeying it. If it constantly rubs us the wrong way, that might be a hint that we are going in the wrong direction. We're not going to delight in reading it if we don't delight in obeying it. I thought about three stages of desire for the Word of God. The first one I would describe as the cod liver oil stage. Now, some of you might remember, as I did as a kid growing up, every fall, without exception, we had to take our annual dose of cod liver oil. That is the worst tasting chemical on this planet by far. I remember dreading taking that cod liver oil. I remember thinking to myself, if I ever become a parent, I will never make my kids drink cod liver oil, and I never have. Now, that's one stage of the Bible. I mean, it's supposed to be good for you. My mom used to say, drink this cod liver oil and you won't get sick this winter. Well, I guess I didn't always get sick, but I do know this much. When we are looking at God's word in that stage, you're just going to dread reading it. You're not going to be anxious to open it up. Now, there's a stage of improvement, slightly, and it's called, I would call it the dry cereal stage. Dry cereal stage. Now, my favorite is Honey Nut Cheerios. But you think I'm going to eat a bowl of Honey Nut Cheerios when I can have bacon and eggs or a sausage biscuit or something like that? I mean, it's, it's okay. It's a whole lot better than cod liver oil. <laughs> it's okay. Now, that might be your stage where you're beginning to realize, it, this is good for me. I need to do that. And so we go through that stage. But then there's a stage that we ought to be all the time, and that's the pie and ice cream stage. Chocolate pie, vanilla ice cream, 
is good 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's good when you're hungry. It's good when you're not hungry. It is just flat good. Now, that's the stage that we need to be in in relationship to God's word. Psalm 119, 103 says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Now, my paraphrase would be, How sweet are your words to my taste, better than chocolate pie and ice cream. He says that we are to delight in it and meditate on it day and night. Now, to meditate on something means to really focus on it, to really concentrate on it, and to keep reflecting on it over and over and over again. That doesn't mean we don't do anything but sit around and read the Bible all day, every day. Obviously, none of us are going to be able to do that. But what it does mean is we fill our minds with God's Word so that we get to the place where we can rely on what's in our minds that we have read and meditated on, and it will guide us in our actions and reactions as we live our lives from day to day. I think about when Jesus was tempted. You remember he was, he was uh, baptized, John baptized him to identify him as a Messiah, and his, the scripture says immediately he was driven into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was tempted. And Satan comes to him on three occasions in his temptation with scripture. Now, he uses scripture out of context, and, and uh, you, you know all of that stuff. But what I want to point out to you is Jesus did not reply to him. Now, I believe somewhere in the Bible, let me look at my concordance and see if I can find what I'm looking for. He knew the word, and he applied the word in the time of temptation, in the time of trial, in the time of confusion. And when we do that, when we fill our minds with his word, then it can guide us as we walk in the way of the righteousness. I read one time, the word will keep us from sin, and sin will keep us from the word. Thomas goes on also to point out some benefits from traveling the way of the righteous. He says in verse 3, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Now, I think what that means is traveling the way of the righteous provides us with an environment in which we can flourish and be fruitful. It provides that environment in which we can flourish and be fruitful. He says, whatever you do prospers. Now, he isn't talking about material prosperity. It's talking about spiritual prosperity. As we walk in the way of the righteous, we are in an environment in which we can flourish and be fruitful as we grow spiritually in our Christian walk each day. Jesus said it this way in John 15 and verse 8. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Chapter 15 talks about the vine and the branches. He's the vine and we are the branches. And he trims us so that we can be more fruitful as we are in that environment in which we can flourish and be fruitful. 
And he says, it's to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty convincing argument to me to walk in the way of the righteous. And I, I'm going to commit the rest of my life, in spite of whatever comes, whatever confusion and uncertainty that might come in our culture, in our nation, I am going to commit myself to walking in the way of the righteous. Now, the other way the psalmist calls the way of the wicked. Now, he doesn't say much about this, but he says enough to warn us. He summarizes the way of the wicked in the opening of verse 4. Four words. Not so the wicked. Not so the wicked. Everything that he says in the psalm about the way of the righteous is not so for the way of the wicked. It's not a happy way. It's not focused on God's word. It's not a fruitful or spiritually prosperous way. He said instead, the wicked are like chaff that's blown away by the wind. The wicked are gone. They will not be able to stand in the judgment. They will not be in the assembly of the righteous. In other words, they will not be in heaven. They will perish. Two ways. The way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. We can never get to the right place if we are on the wrong road. Isn't that genius? Isn't that pure genius? We can never get to the right place if we're on the wrong road. No matter how long we stay on that road, no matter how fast we go down that road, we will never get to the right place. We can go out here to the end of the Forbes Road and turn right, and we will never get to the beach, will we? It just w doesn't happen that way. Now, here's the key. We all know people who are on the wrong road. And we know that they will never get to the right place as long as they travel on that wrong road. And so we need to pray for them. Pray that they will realize that they're on the wrong road and turn around. That's what repentance is, by the way. It's realizing you're on the wrong road and turning around and getting on the right road. It's leaving the way of the wicked and joining the way of the righteous. It's following Jesus rather than following the way of the world. We know people that need to make a change. Some of you this morning right in this room might need to make that change. Maybe you've been thinking about it for a long time. Well, maybe today is the day that you do more than think about it. 
Maybe today is the day you do something about it. Scripture puts it very, very simple. In order to follow Jesus, we have to first of all believe that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. We must be willing to confess that belief before people. We need to be willing to repent of our sins. That's turning around, getting on the right road. And we need to be willing to be baptized by immersion for the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you haven't done those things, I invite you this morning to come forward and we will do whatever is necessary to help you get down through that process. Everything's ready. Dabstry water's warm. Hallelujah. It was freezing cold late yesterday, but it's warm this morning. At least it was a couple hours ago. So it's ready. We have the we have the what you wear ready. You don't have any excuses. Uh, you can just follow Jesus today if that's your desire. Maybe you already follow him, but you're looking for a church home. And if you are, this will be a good one. This will be a good one. And we invite you as an immersed believer to come forward and just let us know you want to be a member of this church. We'll welcome you into our fellowship and put you to work uh, just as soon as you're ready to go to work. Or if you have a need of any kind that you want to come and let us know that we can pray about, uh, we will be willing to do that as well. The choice is yours. Let's stand and sing. sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. Mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Christ is risen, bow down before Him, for He is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen, oh what a Savior, isn't He one?
was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Would you be seated for a moment, please? Susan has come, uh, she's asking for prayer, and she uh, wants to tell us something this morning. First off, um, I've had the worst fibromyalgia flare in years, and last Sunday I could barely walk. I was going to fall flat on my face right over there, and Grant came over, even though he was waiting to come up for communion, Grant came over, and, and I was also uh, crying, and he came over and just comforted me in, in the best way that I know the Lord directed him to do that, and thank you, Grant. And I want to thank Dolores and Dawn. I, it was nursing home Sunday, and I couldn't go. I couldn't walk. And as usual, they did such a great job, and I appreciate that they do that when I can. And this is all to the point of saying uh, tomorrow I go for outpatient um, surgery for my neck. And uh, last time I had it done, just like Miss Helen did one time, it lasted for six months. And six months of no pain was miraculous. And I'm praying and I ask for your prayers that it's just as successful this time and that the pain won't be as bad when they do it. <laughs> so um, I thank you all. I love you all. And I just ask for your prayers for tomorrow for um, the best procedure they can do. And, and thank you to the Sullivans for driving me tomorrow. So... God bless you all. Thank you. Uh, why don't we just pray for her right now? And if you would like to come and just surround her, and we will have a time of prayer for her, just get up right now and just come, and we'll just surround her with our love and with our thoughts and prayers that God's going to be with her tomorrow. Thank you, Tom. You need to hold me up a little bit. Do you want to sit down? Mm -mm. Okay. Lord, what a blessing it is to see these Christian brothers and sisters surrounding our sister in her time of need. We know that you are an awesome God, a God who has all power and all wisdom and loves us more than we could ever imagine being loved. And we know that you are aware of every pain that she's going through. You are aware of every need that she has. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to be merciful. You would bring comfort and healing to her if it could be in your will, Lord. We know that you are able. Uh, we don't know the will for our lives and how it's to play out on this earth. And that's why we trust you. Mm -hmm. That's why we have confidence in you. But we pray especially for tomorrow as the surgeon uh, does the work on her neck, that you will guide him to do exactly what needs to be done, 
and his assistants that will be uh, helping him and that her surgery will be successful, that her recovery would be a good recovery and that she would be restored to health in that area of her body. We just place her, Lord, in your hands and we pray that you would be with her and the Sullivans as they take her tomorrow, that it will be a day of uh, healing and recovery and rejoicing and gladness. And we'll give you all the glory and the honor and praise because you are worthy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you just go back to your seats for a moment, please. If this is your first time at Jarvisburg, we want to say welcome. Uh, we are so happy that you came. We hope that you are happy that you came and will already be making plans to come back. Uh, I'd like to ask you, if you would, to stop by the Welcome Center as you leave out in the lobby. It'll be to your left. And today that little short, cute lady will be out there uh, where I'm usually there. Uh, she will be there to greet you and I get some information from you and pass along some information to you. So keep that in mind. Even if this isn't your very first Sunday, but you've never stopped by and picked up that information, we'd like you to have the opportunity to do that. This is a bulletin. If you didn't get one on the way in, I hope that you will get one on the way out and use it as a reminder of the things that are going on uh, in our uh, program for this week. Uh, the ladies' breakfast is... Uh, this coming Saturday, so keep that in mind. This Wednesday night is our uh, fellowship meal, 6 o'clock before our uh, Bible study at 7. The theme is Italian. Uh, we are asked to bring desserts, and so if you are interested in that, there's also an announcement about Ron beginning a new study in the book of Acts on Wednesday night and some other things in there uh, that you can use as a reminder. Also, there is a prayer insert there with lots of prayer requests. It's, a, it's amazing, the prayer requests. And uh, be, a, be sure to pray about those things as well. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kenny. You're getting me out of a bunch of trouble. I need all the help I can get. So it's not this Saturday. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 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 Amen. God bless you. Good to have you. <laughs> He is a good, good father, isn't he? Let's stand for our closing. We just thank you, Lord, that you allowed us to be here today. What a blessing it has been to worship in your presence. I pray you'd be with Ron and help his foot to heal and uh, he can get back to his normal ministry. I pray you would bless us as we go our separate ways. That we'll walk the way of the righteous. Follow Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.
sorrow comes to steal the joy I owe. And when brokenness and pain is all I know, oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Oh, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your Shame no longer has a place to hide And I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Oh, my fear doesn't Stand a chance when I stand in your love of my fear. Does it stand a chance when I stand in your love? Fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love of my fear. Does it stand a chance when I? 